Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's been a fantastic conference and I've really enjoyed meeting so many cold fusion enthusiasts and got to chat to some really amazing people. Uh, and I guess I'll just sort of start by saying I love cold fusion. Cold fusion is, is amazing. But I'm also impatient about cold fusion. And I'm impatient about cold fusion because of climate change. I, I'm from Australia. We've got this amazing thing called the Great Barrier Reef, but unfortunately about one third of it is now dead. It's turned white due to bleaching uh, because of, because of uh, increases in sea temperature. Uh, but the problem gets worse. The problem gets worse because of, because of lag factors. So lag factors mean that at the moment we're about 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial, but we're actually locked in to above two degrees. And, and what that means is there's some lag factors around, around ice melting, but also around the sulphate um, emissions from coal-fired power stations that mean, that mean when, when we eventually turn the coal-fired power stations off, temperature will continue to increase. So at the moment, we're on track for well above four degrees, um, which, is, which is not going to be pretty. So as an example, um, near, near where I live, we've got these lovely forests, um, the Yarra Valley. So these, essentially, the climate there at, at four degrees is going to look something like the Flinders Ranges. So we're talking major changes to ecosystems all across the world uh, by early next century. So, you know, I, we, ne we need to get impatient about cold fusion. We, ne we need to get some solutions out there. Um, and so what, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is, um, is some uh, linear reactions. And I'm also impatient about linear reactions. Um, now, a lot of people go for the scientific approach, which, which is very important. Reactions taking days, weeks, months, years. So I'm looking at reactions that take around about one millisecond. So this is a, an image here, a picture of, of one of these reactions taking place. So I'll just, I'll just talk you through a bit about my thinking, where I'm coming from. So basically, basically I'm going to start with small hydrogen. So small hydrogen, we've sort of heard about the ultra-dense hydrogen here earlier this week. We've heard about the stuff, I guess, in the last presentation around the, uh, I guess, contracted electron states. And, and I, I agree that, that small hydrogen is, is most probably essential to a lot of these processes. There's a lot of theories out there about what small hydrogen is. And I, I guess you, you start to look into these theories and it can get come a bit confusing. Uh, and I guess... Um, I'm going to just tell you about what my theory is. I'm not necessarily saying it's correct, but when you, when you look at it, maybe at the end of the presentation, you'll, you'll get some idea and you can, you can decide for yourselves whether you think it's a, a valid idea. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at some changes to the, to the fundamental model. Um, I'm, I'm looking at what I call wave particle equivalence. So that's basically the idea that you, you model your particles essentially on waves, but in, in waves in sort of circular motions. Very similar to the toro toroidal ideas that we heard in the previous presentation. Uh, I'm looking at meson-based nucleons. When, when you smash up a proton, you don't get quarks coming out, you get mesons coming out. So to me, mesons seem a lot more sensible um, as a, as a sub-particle for the, for the proton and, and the other nucleons. And I guess the, uh, just, just to summarise the, the proton, so essentially the new model for the proton is, is three mesons, basically a pi meson on the outside, a k meson on the inside, and then uh, one in the middle, was, which is essentially about the mass of two pions. And we had actually a presentation earlier this week where, where they potentially identified that, that new uh, meson. And we actually, uh, one of the guys, Sven, pull, pulled up a... Um, a an, an article, a published article, which had actually identified this, pro, this uh, meson a few years back, but no one believed them. But um, I think it's, it's definitely um, consistent with my, with my model. I guess the other point also is the idea of a composites. So looking at the alpha particle as a composite rather than two protons and two neutrons. And then the nucleus gets built up essentially from these alpha-based particles with a few other things uh, where, where the numbers don't quite match up. And that actually ties in quite, quite nicely with your bonding, chemical bonding properties. Uh, so in terms of the linear stuff, we're, we're really looking at... Um, hang on, is that right? Uh, yep, OK. So in terms of the linear stuff, going back to the small hydrogen, hydrogen idea, um, so the small hydrogen model I'm looking at is it's, it's, I guess, looking at going below ground state, uh, which, which Mills, the Mill, Mills sort of came up with a theory around that uh, 
probably about almost 25 years ago. Uh, but the difference with my model is that the sizes are not actually based on the Rydeberg model of, of excited states, which the, the Rydeberg model is sort of you've got n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and the sizes are based just on, on the n factor. Um, now, now, when you're actually trying to apply this model to Lina, it doesn't work. But um, if, you, if you apply uh, something slightly different, which is basically the, the Rydeberg states are essentially two times the previous state. So say, for example, n equals 3 is twice the size of n equals 2, then it starts to make a lot more sense. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of explain that a bit more as, as we go through the presentation. Uh, and I guess, the, I guess the, the basis for this sort of the, the Rydeberg size, I, I guess it really comes back to this idea of ground state centricity, that, that, that everything is sort of a, a multiple of ground state. But if you move away from the ground state as being this sort of be all and end all sort of state, you sort of start to say, well, do we need ground state um, centricity? And so the idea of just having these states related to the previous one by a factor of two starts to maybe make more, more logical sense. Okay, so the, the new electron model, um, essentially you've you got the ground state there, the green one, uh, and, then, and then as you go to your excited state, you're essentially going twice as big, uh, and then a, as you go out to the infinite electron, you're looking at, at, at a waveform. Um, and then, when, then, then the new stuff, I guess, is you're going in the other direction, you're looking at these de-excited states, so you're, go, you're going smaller and smaller and smaller by a factor of two each time. Um, now, also important there is the primary state, uh, so when you do the, the wave particle, particle equivalence uh, calculation and work out what, what size should the electron be, it doesn't come out to the ground state size, it comes out to this size of around about this primary state. And interestingly, the primary state is pretty similar to, the, to what the ultra-dense hydrogen guys were saying, pretty much exactly what they were looking at in terms of the size of their ultra-dense hydrogen. The other thing to look at there is the energy transitions between, between states, um, and you can simply just work that out with the Rydeberg equation by, by using fractional n values. So you get your transitions um, from n equals 2 to n equals 1, that's your, your 10.2. From infinite to n equals 1, that's your 13.6. And then when you start going down, you, your jumps get bigger and bigger. So you've got 40.8 40 and then, then 108.8 as your sort of next step down. Now, now Mills from um, Blacklight Power came out with some of these, these transition energies sort of 25 years ago. So it's, um, but, but I guess my, my change is the factor of two in, in the sizes. And when you, when you start to think leaner, you, later on you'll see how that, that's necessary. Um, okay, so superchemical reactions. So I guess that one of the sort of things that's coming out here is, is okay, well, some of these reactions, you know, what the energies that are coming, that coming out are, are not necessarily high energies. Potentially, they're a lot lower energies. And so there's this idea potentially of super chemical reactions. So chemical reactions tend to be around a few EVs, but if we, if we do one of these transitions to a de-excited state, um, as, as per the previous slide, you're looking at sort of 40.8, 108.8, you know, so, so some higher energies, but we're not talking nuclear, we're talking super chemical. Uh, and that's an example there of a reaction that I, I've managed to create, which is potentially a super chemical reaction. Um, so a similar, similar uh, diagram here, but one of the questions that's always asked is, okay, well, if we've got these de-excited states, how come everything doesn't just naturally drop down to de-excited states? Um, and to understand that, you've really got to go back to this idea of, of background energy and the idea that essentially the uh, states continue up and they get, they get more and more excited, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, but, but they're all stable up until ground state. So ground state's stable, everything goes up there, stays at ground state, but then once it gets past ground state, it becomes unstable, and so it decays by photon decay back to ground state. But the lower states are stable, um, so they naturally transition up to gr ground state, but you can actually uh, potentially uh, activate these states through, through catalytic reactions. Okay, so I'm now going to talk about dense hydrogen catalysts. Um, so if we, if we want to actually try and achieve some of these, these states of de-excited hydrogen, um, we can actually do it quite nicely um, using some, uh, some information which has been previously uh, identified around auger electron energies. So as, as an example here, a copper has an auger, auger electron energy of around 122.5 EVs. Um, which matches quite nicely to the transition energy from, uh, uh, from the infinite electron to the electron at n equals one, equal one, one third, um, with a very small error percentage there. Um, and, and this is some examples of some copper-based reactions, uh, letting off quite, quite a nice amount of light there. 
Um, and this is, this is our brass electrodes here, and you can sort of see a nice sort of um, aura around, around the reaction there. So, so we can develop these catalyst tables based on this information, um, and essentially we can, we can work out what the catalyst might be to go from any, any state to any other state. Uh, and this table here has is, is been sort of developed um, based on all these different organ energies. And so you can see copper there um, up, up in the, uh, the top left. And then if we look across it, so the purple ones are the really good matches. So that's less than 0.1% uh, energy match. So the next one across at, at one on five, you say, well, what's that? Um, well, that is actually palladium. Um, again, a very nice energy match. Um, okay, so, so now I want to talk a bit more, I guess, about this, this new model and Lena. So essentially, the, 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 the new theoretical basis that I'm working with is we're looking at uh, creating these new dense hydrogen um, forms of hydrogen, and then we're looking at potentially capturing these dense forms of hydrogen uh, by another nucleus um, and, and creating our transmutations. So I guess the, the idea here is that once we get down to these, these lower dense hydrogen states, their effectiveness for creating linear reactions goes up. Uh, unfortunately, also, the, the catalyst effectiveness tends to go down once we get too high. So there's potentially some sweet spots around there somewhere in the middle where we get a bit of uh, reasonable uh, catalyst effectiveness and also increased potential for, uh, for uh, dense hydrogen formation and, and linear. Okay, so going back to the small hydrogen idea. So small hydrogen, we're looking at around about three to 400 um, fermions as, as, as the radius. So that's about n equals one on eight. And we say, okay, well, what's gonna give us that, um, that, that transition energy needed of around about 8, 870 EVs? Uh, well, that actually works out quite nicely as nickel um, with, a, with an error percentage of 0.04%. So, you know, it's, it seems to be working quite nicely with what we know as linear catalysts. Uh, are there more catalysts? Yes. Um, so you can, you can see in this diagram here um, some of the other stuff coming in. So that there's another one next to nickel. There's, um, there's also, I think we, we had some mention of, of lanthanum earlier in the week by, by John Paul Bavarian. That actually fits in quite nicely at n equals 1 on 10. Uh, and then as we go higher up, we sort of see strontium, uh, zirconium, uh, silver, and then up to titanium. And also, interestingly, lithium's in there quite nicely at n equals, n equals 1 on 2. So we, we're starting to see pretty much all the catalysts that, that we've seen in Lena appearing in, this, in, this, uh, in these charts, which, you know, to me is a, it's quite a surprise when it came out, but um, yeah, it seems to work quite nicely. Uh, this one here, this is a, a photo of a, a strontium hydroxide reaction, which uh, creates quite a nice, uh, nice sort of blue spark. And I guess uh, I've also done a whole lot of experimentation with other hydroxides, so I can compare the I guess the reaction morpho morphology of, say, calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, and a whole range of different other hydroxides, and the strong team stuff comes out looking, looking quite different and quite, quite an, a nice little uh, flash reaction there. Uh, so dense hydrogen capture. So this is obviously a two-stage uh, process, and I guess once we form these, these dense hydrogen um, entities, we need to work out what's going to capture them. Um, so, so I guess that's, that's the, the sort of lithium has is, is obviously been identified as, as something. Boron's been talked about a fair bit. Potassium was used in a lot of earlier experiments. Uh, but essentially, I guess the idea of these sort of tritium groups on the outside, these sort of extra tritium seems to have something to do with what's, what's needed to, to increase their potential for, for capture. Um, so an example of one of the experiments I did early on, uh, I, I was really looking for a very low-cost linear experiment. Uh, sort of under $500, so I used a couple of stainless steel lighting plates, potassium hydroxide, electrolysis, and then hit it with a uh, far infrared heat, heat lamp, and, and excess energy came out of that one. Uh, I guess also potassium hydroxide with catalytic electrodes. There you can see a nice reaction with a nice big, big halo coming out of it. So the, the hydroxides are, are often a, a relatively simple, low-cost way to have a look at some of the potential around these reactions. Um, experimental conf confirmation. So I, I guess I had a theory here. I had a few nice light flashes and, you know, great to show the photos to your friends and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, at some point you've got to, probably got to do a bit of science. Um, so um, 
I've, this is my contraption that, that I've been using to, to do the testing, and it's got a hell of a lot of capacitors. Um, and, and you're looking at a, a DC pulse, but, but interest, interestingly, the important thing is not to just contact the electrodes and leave them con contacted. You've actually got to bounce the electrodes off each other. Uh, and so we've been doing that, getting the reactions, and then we've sent the electrodes off for XRF analysis, and also obviously taking the, the photography of it as well too. So I guess, guess what, what we're thinking here is when we, we make contact, you get a, a large flow of electrons going through, and then as the electrodes come apart, uh, you've almost got a, uh, it's sort of like a water hammer effect, I guess. So your, your electrons are, are probably, uh, in a pressure situation, because the, the flow is essentially restricted, the idea is the electrons start to um, essentially pressurise and potentially create these, these smaller and smaller sized electrons. So, I mean, I, I guess the idea is there, you may be able to do a lot of this stuff without, you know, any, any catalyst potentially or whatever, but just using a, almost like a pressure flow situation to, to create these smaller electron states. Um, and so, so in terms of the XRF analysis, so I guess moly bedenum electrodes, something, something we had a look at. Um, and so we looked at some, we've got some decreases in phosphorus and magnesium, but they can be ruled out in terms of basically boil off effects that we heard about earlier in the week. Um, we did have some increase, increases in calcium, titanium and, and chromium. And so I guess if you look, go back to your tables, you say, well, molybdenum's an average catalyst for H n equals one quarter and then n equals one sixth. Uh, tungsten electrodes, increases in iron, copper, zinc and zirconium, and uh, tungsten comes out as a very nice catalyst for H equals N equals one on six. Uh, titanium, now titanium here is very interesting. When, when you look at this reaction morphology, you're actually getting these, these secondary reaction effects. And someone's described this as the sparkler effect. Uh, and whether it's happening in sparklers or not, I, I I'm not sure. But it, but it is very interesting that you get the central reaction. You're not getting such a, so much of these halo effects, but, the, but whatever's in there is coming out and then, I guess, essentially reacting a second time. And that second reaction is, is obviously very, very high energy. You can sort of see those sort of sparkler formations there. You know, you're getting a hell of a lot of reactions happening there. And you're even sort of, you can see, if you look closely, even getting these sort of tertiary reactions happening. Uh, so if you do the analysis on titanium, well, you find out that titanium is actually not very catalytic at the, uh, the lower um, uh, in, well, or one on n values, but it becomes uh, catalytic at around n equals one on, on 19. So if you do your calculations again uh, and, and look at the radius, uh, it actually works out that if, if you are getting some n equals one on 19, you've actually got a radius of around 0.1 um, uh, fm, which is actually obviously smaller than the radius of the, of the proton. Uh, and then so you've actually start to think about, uh, you know, are, are we potentially having some subnuclear reactions? Um, and I guess the sort of the, the really, those sort of sparkler-like formations, you know, are, are we looking at a, a totally new class of reaction here happening? Um, and so, so when you do the XRF analysis on this stuff, um, we got a massive increase in zinc around 0.2%. Now that's not 0.2% increase in the amount of zinc, that's 0.2% that's increase in the, the total elemental composition. Um, and so, yeah, there was definitely, and that was just in a few reactions. So, you know, we are looking at, and, and, if, you, and if you go to your basic ball off sort of explanation, well, no, actually, um, zinc should have boiled off well before titanium. Um, so that, that, that percentage should, should probably be, be a lot higher. Um, so, you know, you, you, I guess the idea of fast linear is, is really coming to the fore. You know, potentially you, you can achieve a linear reaction very, very quickly uh, in less than a thousandth of a second. And I, I guess the, the sort of the, 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 the summary in, in terms of all this stuff is, is I think maybe we, we, we almost need to start thinking again in terms of what we're looking at here. And I guess my, my thinking on this stuff at the moment really is we, we've got three potential classes of, of reaction here rather than just one. Uh, the first is the superchemical, uh, so these electron transitions. Uh, the second is linear, so that, that's when we're starting to look at our, our transmutations. And that, they, they may, may be catalyzed by our, our superchemical transitions in the first place. And then the third one is, is these subnuclear 
um, reactions there, and you can you can see on the far right that's a that's some some hyd hydrogen loaded electrons there with a with a fairly large um, explosive output. Um, so uh, in terms of the climate change side of things, um, I, I think we, we we perhaps need to need to have a think about what we want to do in terms of mass production of energy systems for the general population. And I guess my, my thinking is, okay, you know, all the transmutation stuff, it does start to get complicated. We've got a whole lot of things going there, probably suitable for large scale reactors. But I mean, if, if we're talking about sort of stuff for, for domestic use, smaller scale, then I think there's, there's enough potential in these super chemical reactions to create very high uh, energy outputs, way higher than chemical at a very small scale um, potentially without any, any of the sort of nuclear issues. In some ways, if we're trying to build a, a super chemical reactor, we actually want to try and avoid anything to do with LENAR. You know, we, we don't want our transmutations. We just want our energy coming out. Um, so, you know, perhaps a, a totally new perspective on, on, on cold fusion. But, um, yeah, I, hopefully whoever works it out, we can all work it out soon and we can, we can get some uh, new systems out there and, and hope to... Uh, curb the, uh, the climate change problem in the near future. Thank you. Well, we've gone way over for this uh, uh, session. If there's a short question. Thank you. Excellent presentation. On the spark effect, uh, we saw that with iron in, with Suha Srauskar, it went through an entire one centimeter uh, of rebar in uh, 0.6 of a second. Wow. Normally that only happens with um, nanoparticles like it's pyrolytic iron in air and it produced wurtzite crystals of FeO, single oxide. Yeah. Um, you're doing 200 joules, Adamenko used 300 joules. I, I would suggest one other experiment. <coughs> uh, understanding cold electricity, I suggested cutting the return line and attaching a, um, a power monitor to the rebar. It was insulated no other power produced 1.3 volts. Um, I would suggest having an experiment to see if you've got any residual something in there that produces cold electricity after you've done your shock. Yeah, okay, that's, that's uh, interesting. I've, I've, I've sort of heard uh, talk around these sort of back currents coming out of some of these, these type of systems. I, I haven't done anything, but it would actually be something reasonably simple to do with a, essentially a coil of wire around one of the conductors and, and an oscilloscope. So yeah, that would be definitely okay. interesting to investigate that and, and see, see what would happen with You can that. see the videos of the same kind of effects on, on, on our YouTube. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Good suggestion. <laughs>